Alright everybody, we'll, we'll get started now. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, no demos this time, we're just going to do a, a, a group exercise. Um, we've done a couple of the last couple of meetups and they've gone really well, so we wanted to do a more of a participatory um, thing with everyone. And this is kind of inspired by um, Alex and I, so last week, last week? We were asked to. No, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to say we were asked to pitch to us to Capital Factory, and they said, then you have basically a few minutes to do it, very, very short amount of time. So we have to go through the exercise of condensing everything that we know about our startup and all the hard work that we've had to do into a very, very brief kind of like, it was four minutes, um, but a very condensed version of what we're doing. And so we were like, hey, we should, we should try to, it's a really good lesson for everyone to learn to condense everything about a business into a very short um, pitch. And so we wanted to do an exercise with the group to go through a elevator pitch exercise. And so we found a list of, according to hypebot.com, which is a um, music tech news aggregator, they created a list of what they think are the best music startups for 2015 and beyond. Uh, most of them are new, they're international, so it could be a mix of US and non-US companies, and we thought we would split everyone up into teams. Teams can look at five, we haven't looked at any of these, so we're, we're going in blind like you guys are. Check out the technologies, pick out the one that you like the best as a group, and we'll have somebody come up and do an elevator pitch for us to try to condense all the stuff that you learned fairly quickly and try to sell us on why it's cool, why it's relevant, why we should be interested in this technology. Afterward, you guys can say if there was one that was really terrible, one that was cool but didn't quite make the best one, um, and just start a conversation around, you know, what, what are the interesting music startups um, around the world. So anyway, we'll, we'll divide people up. I don't know how many people are here, but. Do you want to do introductions first? Yeah, we can go around the room. If you want to just go, we'll, we'll do it. We, di we divvied up into groups of three, so just say one, two, or three, and then just do a quick introduction. I think there's, there's some new faces here, but we'll do a quick introduction, say uh, who you are, what brought you to the group, and then we'll go from there. Just shout out one, two, three, so you know what group you're in. Oh, I'll go first. Uh, one, Luis, uh, I am a co-founder of both this meetup and also Music Meets Video, which is a startup that I'm working with, on with Alex, and um, we host cover competitions for up-and-coming artists, uh, backgrounds in finance, and I also work for a venture capital firm in town called Startup Runner. Um, all the th same things that we said, um, my background's in design and video production, and I work in freelance design. You're two, that's how you number first. I'm two. I'm three, I'm Alex, uh, Alex Aaron just moved to Austin recently to help out my parents transition to an assisted living facility. <laughs> and, uh, Let's see, my background is, um, I guess I was mainly working as an investor for like 20 years in Wall Street and uh, involved in all kinds of different kinds of things there with investments and now I have retired to Austin where the young people were retired, like Brother India. And uh, I guess now I'm an independent artist, let's call it. Uh, I'm Mike Delgado. Uh, you're one, you gotta say your number. I'm number one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I'm a software engineer, um, and I work, I, I code, and I also uh, do music on the side, as well as code music, I guess. So that's what I do. Um, yeah, I'm a two. Uh, my name's Tim. Uh, I'm a medical librarian. And where are you visiting from? Uh, Fort Worth. Oh, okay. Not very far. Okay. Three, I'm Mario, as the shirt shows. Um, <laughs> trying to get an ed that's, tech startup off the ground. No, it's, it doesn't have a loop. Oh, that's um, okay. Yeah, I like music. Cool. Uh, one, uh, I'm Andy Ellery. Uh, I've got a music startup, it's an iPhone app. Send me release and concert updates. Uh, moved down here in October. Uh, back 
runs in advertising, monetization of apps, websites. Item two. Uh, genetics, I got comments in copywriting, direct response sales, lead generation, and um, my husband and I just moved up from South America on Friday. So we're new in Austin. On Friday? Wow. Yeah, we're South America. We are total freshies here in Austin again. Ecuador. Ecuador? Very nice. Um, we're in the music business. I'm along for the ride. Wow. So. How long are you in Ecuador? Five and a half years. Where in Ecuador? Quite good. Okay. I have a beautiful city. Very nice. I have. Yeah, cool. Producer, musician, guitar player, audio engineer, and like Ben said, we just moved here on Friday, so kind of get to know the music scene and the scene in general here in Austin. And, uh, Good. Cool. What? Matt DeWitt, a uh, visualist by trade. I spent a number of years with R&D for PRG and uh, went independent for a few years. I'm taking a break to bring you back to development and building fun tools to make live shows awesome. What's PRG? Production resource group. They're, they're the, they do all the really, really big productions. Okay. Cool. There's a couple of the guys in the group that are here today, but they're also working on live music tech, so you should talk to them. Right here? Yep. There's one right there. <laughs> the history one just walked in, but y'all need to talk. Uh, what was one? Two. Right. Two. Uh, my name's Eric. Uh, background, I guess, in marketing and robotics. Um, and I spent a couple years running shows. I'm working at a company uh, kind of connecting people up with festivals. And then also helping out with some kind of marketing and business consulting on a couple of other companies. Um, so checking out what interesting things are going on. Cool. Uh, David, number year three. Three. Um, I'm a software developer. Um, I've, I've, I've been working on a composition for about uh, uh, ten years, musical composition, and so I'm at the point now where I want to produce it with some other people and so I'm just curious and meeting some like-minded people and just uh, mix the contacts basically. Uh, so what are all the numbers? You're, you're one. Okay. one. I'm one and uh, my name's Theron and uh, I'm working on a project called Synesthesia. Uh, it's a piece of software for musicians to um, generate live reactive visuals based on their audio data and their MIDI data. They demoed it last time and it was very cool. And they've actually, since, they, they've demoed it in real life. Yeah, yeah, we played uh, two shows in the last month, which were our first outings onto a real stage, responding to a real musician, so. How'd they go? Uh, it went well. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine that it went pretty well. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. One, two, one, two. Uh, my name's Charles. Backgrounds, DJ, who's audio engineer. Do some stuff like social media, actually. and I heard about a bunch of music people being up there, so let's see what's going on. I'm Chris, I'm three. Um, I'm in a music industry student at ACC. Um, I love I love going into the recording studio, um, working at the board. We have a uh, a Day King analog board, a 32 track Day King analog board in one control room over there, A, and then there's another one, B, that's connected to this studio that's a different board. I haven't worked with that one much. I'm off for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one, my 
My name is Chris. I'm here writing an article for Downtown Live. Uh, it's uh, about this music tech meetup, and if you guys have any cool stories you want to cue me on to, let me know. I'm always down to find some good pieces and uh, get some good publicity and press up there. Cool. What's Downtown Live? Uh, Downtown Live is a social media network for musicians in Austin. And what it does is it puts their sound cloud players up there, their open availability dates, and these artists can create profiles. So what they can do is when the venues have profiles, they can actually direct their book to go to bypass book occasions. It uh, makes the booking process a lot easier and connects you know, the fans, the venues, and uh, the artists all in one local spot. Cool, cool. You too, by the way. My turn? Yeah. And three. Cool. Uh, David, three, sorry I was late. Um, I do tech support for Apple full time, and it's pretty lame. <laughs> uh, and then I guess I'm just part time bedroom producer, slash DJ, slash guitarist, slash Guy Fieri enthusiast. Very cool. Well, a lot of audio engineers in the house tonight. Like five or six. Yeah. Cool. Well, should we get started? Yeah, let's go. Um, so I guess uh, all the ones hang out over here, two somewhere back here, and threes up front here. Beer in that thing? Yes. It's gluten free beer. Awesome. What? One. Three. Split between these two. Yeah. I'm a two. Yes. Uh, you want to quickly explain that the two balance works? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, super good. Um, Luis, should we, should we make another group so we can we do four groups? Are there enough? I don't know. Are there, do we have too many people for that? Okay, fine. Okay. Um, if you came in late and missed the sort of intro part, um, basically we are giving everyone five startups to look at, and basically you're going to pick one of the startups, they're all music tech startups, and give it um, more two. Oh, I'm a two, so I'll be over there. Um, yeah, it works. Someone forgot they were thought they're a three or a one, but they're actually a two. That's okay. Um, does everyone have a computer with them where they can look up these companies? Uh, we, we, have one. we just need one per group. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. One yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're good. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. I guess we're gonna take 20 minutes. Everyone just go through and look. You know, take three or four minutes to look at each uh, startup. Decide which one you want to. Uh, focus on and we'll move on from there in about 20 minutes. So go for it. Uh, all right, y'all. Uh, we have our first presentation. We're starting with group number one. Who's it going to be? Awesome. I'll stand over here. I did this formal stock. Everyone, um, we're going to do a really short Q and A on on these. So think of questions that you have. Do have a formal time? All right. So our product is Shred Video. Uh, Shred Video is um, attacking the problem of people with lots of uh, GoPro video footage of all this action sports footage that they've collected, but maybe they don't have the skills, time, effort, or energy, or ability to. Uh, to edit that video. So what we have is a piece of software that you buy, and using the footage that you've captured from your GoPro, it takes, uh, it uses a proprietary algorithmic software to recognize motion and uh, using the accelerometer data from the camera, from the GoPro cameras that are built in with the newer models, to automatically assess action footage you drop in your audio track, uses audio analysis to sample that audio and find choruses and verse and beat moments, and automatically edits down your action video into a continuous video matched with the music ready for upload to YouTube. So our uh, user base or market is um, 
obviously people with a disposable income to already have a GoPro video camera that uh, partakes in action sports and um, wants to get that video that they've been sitting on and collecting and recording out so they can share it. All you have to do, come home from the day on the slopes, take your GoPro, connect it up, drag all the files over, pick the song you want. It analyzes all of that, edits it together into a video for you, and you can start sharing it. Send it to your friends so that you can watch the video as you guys chow down on dinner that night. All right. Can you edit the sensitivity? Uh, is how abstract? We don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. Um, we believe the, uh, the the idea would be that you'd be able to go through and through the editing of it um, as you're watching the final cut. You can say yes, no, try again. That one was right or something like that. Okay, so, so, you can, so like, does yeah. it learn? Like, uh, that, there's no. I, I imagine there's. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> believe the software learns, but uh, I have yeah, personally worked. I demand, I demand sentience. <laughs> I, have, I don't know if the software itself works, but I have experience with computer vision and do know that there are remarkable uh, abilities to detect action and face recognition and things like that within a pretty short pass to take a piece of video and decide whether or not um, it's fast paced, has a face in it that's moving in an interesting way, mixed with the accelerometer data from the GoPro to make sure that it's not you like attaching it to your helmet. Yeah. How is this related to music? Uh, it uses audio analysis to figure out uh, the key moments of the song that you choose so that the video is edited to the beat of the music. Oh, cool. So, you know, like. Um, Sonic Visualizer, if you guys have used that, that would be a pretty approachable example of how it's pretty easy to go through and find, algorithmically find good moments to edit and then just use those as cut points. Plus, that's more people editing videos to YouTube. It is. Yes? What makes for a local download and how much does it cost? Uh, it is a local download, we believe, and we do not know the price. <laughs> we presume it would be affordable to the market of people buying GoPoints. Like right. Email. It's out of my price range. <laughs> it's not a subscription. That's what I was trying to ask. It's not right. It's not a subscription from what we can tell. As well from what we can tell, there's not a hell of a lot of, um, I mean, most of the work is done in the algorithmic processing of it. The interface wouldn't be that much. Um, so it shouldn't be that difficult of software to develop front end wise, you're mostly just working on the algorithms and then spitting out the video. Has it already been funded? No, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't believe so. So is it only GoPro or is there any um, plans to um, use any other kind of video? From what we understand, one of the um, predominant pieces of technology making this software possible is the accelerometer data in the GoPro to greatly aid in weeding out the cruff from the video. Um, to uh, to uh, find the usable moments that you would actually want. Um, from what we can tell, it's GoPro. Cool. Good job. Yeah. Most of the time, what you can do project-wise and career-wise is limited by who you know. So whether you're a producer, you're limited by how many contacts you have for your studio. If you're a session musician, you're limited by how many recording people you know. If you're a bedroom artist or geographically remote, you're limited by the other connections in the music industry that you have. So we've created a platform that lets you connect with talent from around the world to uh, finish your recording, find session musicians, and connect with producers who can give you a great mix. Yeah, that's where we bring in the whole Sound Better piece. Um, basically, we allow you to 
you know, as an artist, connect up with producers and audio technicians, or connect up with uh, session musicians. As a producer, it allows you to, you know, find more people needing your services. Um, and so we're not just focused on, you know, the giant studios and the big artists that are gonna that are gonna know each other. They're gonna be the names that are known. We're much more focused on, you know, the artists and the producers that have the talent, but don't necessarily have the connections. Those are gonna be, be the people most benefiting from Sound Better, and connecting them up allows a lot more work to get done for much better prices um, for the artists, but more work for the producers, and overall allows people to create their music and make it sound better. <laughs> so the platform that we've got, um, if you use Elance, it's laid out kind of like an Elance for this different project. You can load in your personal profile, it's free. Um, whether you're looking for a producer, or you are a producer, or you're a session musician, or you're looking for one. So you can load in about you, samples of your portfolio, and then start matching yourself up with other people in the system that are in your genre or that if you want to record a song, someone who does recording. And you put your project out there, collect bids, so there's transparency, you can choose among different people, you have a chance to listen to samples and do that quality check. So because of that, it kind of blows through the barriers and really opens up the demographic to younger people, older people, people in Austin, people all over the US, internationally, um, so that you can get it done. So is it more of like kind of like a social media thing or like can you post like projects, have someone work on it and then like kind of like kind of so like a collaboration type? It's or? it's much more of a model similar to kind of like an Elance where you post kind of this is the project that I want to do mm -hmm. and um, basically people on the production side will bid on it. Okay. Um, and then you choose who you want to go with based off of you know, their samples, their ratings and recommendations and from the musicians. Like on their profile? Yep. Okay, cool. I know. And you can also put in your budget. You know, I'm looking for someone to master my song, and this is my price range. Okay, so, so it's like Odes. So yeah. 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 Odes and Elance just combined. They're okay. basically the same. So now it's going to work. So yeah. work. But there's no collaboration piece where once you, you know, make the deal, there isn't a way to kind of. It's, a, it's more of a, you know, okay, do this and then come back and bring it to me versus like, here is like the piece that you need to work on, let's collaborate on it, work it together. Well, in, in most kind of music production environments, that's really going to be an inherent thing in it. Because if a musician is working with a producer, um, there's kind of a necessary uh, geographical relationship uh, the musician has to be in the studio with the producer, so there's already going to be a collaborative element there where they're going to be face-to-face -face working together. There can be back and forth like that. That doesn't actually need to be on the platform. Okay, all right. So, and if you're totally remote, I mean, you have access to all the technologies. You, know, you can FaceTime, you can Skype, you know, you can do that sort of virtual collaboration. Or you can just say, you know, I work days, you work nights, this is how we're gonna get the project done, even if we're not real time collaborating. Is the revenue model also similar to the podcast car? Yeah, very, very similar model where they take a percentage cut out of each. Group. Yeah, they take a percentage cut. The you know the artists see one price, and then the producers get a slightly lower price. But the flip side of that, of course, being by paying to use the platform, you also get safeguards. If I pay for the work and you never deliver, mm. one, I can rate you down, but I can also file a claim and get my money back. So. Do they list their percentage? Yeah, it's in their terms. Yeah, of course. So nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're very competitive in our market. <laughs> <laughs> can this be extended to consumers who aren't in the music industry so that you know somebody who wants to, say, write a song and record it just for fun? Yeah, then absolutely. Have, then have this network, 
and also they have the tools to be able to maybe write the song and what kind of what kind of support do they need because if, they are, if I'm a consumer who's getting into this for the first time and maybe the last time I wouldn't know what kind of recording artists or what 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 assets I would need uh, so I'm very new to the whole the whole thing but you know having a package where a consumer comes in and they can kind of record their own song and have help from from people to, to do put that together so it won't really be built as just kind of an all-in-one package yeah. um, but you know some of the information is there based around kind of what you need and you know you can connect up even if you're writing a song for the first time uh, you can connect up with uh, other songwriters to help you kind of ghostwrite it. You can connect up with um, producers to help you record it. You can connect up with session musicians to actually play it to get it recorded. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of all through the whole process to take it from the idea and you know the lyrics that you have written down on the back of a napkin and take it to something recorded with professional musicians right. and studio mastered ready to to go out to them. it's almost like you can you, so a consumer can write a song with lyrics and then push it into this platform and then have say six seven guitarists uh, create a version of that song send yeah. it back in an Absolutely. audio file and uh, you know you kind of get to pick which one is which one sounds really cool mm -hmm. and then you you go with that well, and you can get your best guitar right. and get somebody else to do vocals right. and somebody to draw things, and then take those three pieces right. and have a producer mix them all together so that you have one song with the full profile. Cool, good job. I'm Darren, and um, we have Dice FM, which um, it's an application um, that's currently based specifically in London. Um, but you know, it's it's really good for finding new artists and going to, to new shows. So um, you know, just think of a scenario where you just flew into London. You're gonna have like a 48 hour layover for whatever reason, because you know, I'm not a book flights, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> so you got 48 hours to kill in London. Um, you're not really into music. I mean, you kind of listen to what's on the radio, whatever. But either way, you want something to do. So you know that your friend mentioned Dice FM to you. You pull up the app on your phone. Um, it gives you like a breakdown of who's going to be in town that night, where they're going to be, how much tickets are. And it also kind of breaks down how popular those, those bands are, how many people are going to that show. Um, and like what they're similar to. So let's say you find someone you're not really familiar with, but you can see that it's gonna be a cool show. I know that they're kind of like these other bands that I, I really like. Uh, you can go ahead and book tickets off of there. And um, yeah. Yeah, so how they go above and beyond in this whole process, you know, it's like you might be thinking that, well, there's a lot of places I can go that kind of like, for example, like an Eventbrite or a Ticketmaster or like a live nation where it's like, yeah, I can kind of, I can get a sense for what shows are going on. The way Dice works is they offer you access to, if there aren't tickets available for a lot of these shows that are, you know, for up and comers where they're likely to sell out really quickly, they offer exclusive tickets that aren't available to everybody else. They offer a waiting list uh, for tickets so they can notify you if, tickets become available, if more tickets become available for a specific show. Uh, they're also, the recommendations are backed by fan input and they're also backed by the team at DICE and, and also uh, by Red Bull Music Studios, which are the same people behind, uh, for example, the Red Bull Music Academy, Red Bull Three Style Competition, and Red Bull Culture Clash, which are big outlets for brand new music of all types around the world. So that's something that they offer, you know, to be able to give you the best recommendations. And they do all their ticket booking with no ticket fee, which is just about no ticket booking service will give you that. 
So yeah, it's pretty much what DICEFM is useful for. Again, like I said, it's uh, as of right now, it's just based specifically in London, uh, which you know, London's already one of like the music capitals of the world. So I'm sure that'll expand within time. Yeah, it's uh, it's really. If you think about it, it's applicable to just about anywhere that has a decently sized music scene. You know, it's like you might think about just touching down in any city and it's like, how do you even find out who's doing what? You know, it's like that's where something like Dice would come in. And to be able to get tickets that everybody else can't get, be able to get on a waiting list and get no no booking fees, a win win. So no. And that's what's up. What's the relationship that DICE has with the different venues? Uh, we don't know uh, specifics. We assume that, because their website was actually pretty uh, pretty heavy on the fact that they don't talk about how their revenue is made. Um, I think it's mafia. But um, <laughs> um, we assume that it's, it's due to two things. We assume it's a corporate sponsorship, which is why they're able to do the uh, Red Bull culture class, things like that, bring those artists. Uh, but I also think that it's, uh, they have to be getting a percentage off of the venues because the venues, at the end of the day, they want to sell that show out, you know? They don't want to have, they don't want to be 10 second, 10 tickets short of selling out. Um, so that's kind of where Dice comes in. They take those 10 tickets, they offer them, you know, because you're not going to go to a show if you assume it's going to be selling out. That's 10 more tickets that they will have sold, you know, and I think that a lot that comes into that is that lack of booking fees, you know? There's a lot of people I wanna go see, but when I go to like, when I go online to buy, buy tickets to it, it's like a $20 ticket and then tax, some fee, some other type of fee. By the end of the day, it's almost a $40 ticket. I don't $40 wanna see whatever band it is, but I'll go see them for 20 bucks. So keep in mind also that if you go to the website and you take a look at the venues they're partnered with, some of them are actually really, really huge venues like that are known throughout the world. And they have artists on there that, they have a lot of artists that are unknown artists on there, but they have several artists on there that are already big and are already, you know, are already internationally known artists. Yeah, so, so it's not it just might like, not, yeah, it might not be anything. just like 10 tickets more that they're able to sell. It might be four or 500 more for a show where you're gonna have a few thousand people. Is there so, any waiting uh, on the results based on the user's play history, like scrolling or? You mean does anyone get like? Does anyone like? Well, like does it get suggestions by your account from other connected accounts? Like it knows I think that so. I listen to. I don't remember if it like. Yeah. Because so. that's what uh, I assume it does. Because that's what Bands in Town does. Like right. you connect right. via Facebook right. or via Last FM or what right. have you. Uh, and I'm fairly certain that's how it gets its recommendations. So, you know, like I said, you're, you're in London for the day, you don't really care about music, but you know that a lot of your friends are and you trust their judgment, you can see, you know, this is kind of what's recommended for you. But I see a broader market, not just in someone that's there for the day, but someone living there. Mm -hmm. They have it Absolutely. set up with yeah. and to maybe alert them, hey, this show that uh, a band that you listen to is playing tonight and there are extra tickets. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then that's why I think, like it's starting out in London, it sounds like something that has the potential to grow. Uh, you know, obviously the bigger music cities, Austin would be a good choice. It would also be helpful in the more rural areas because if you've got those people who are living in, you know, just outside of Chicago and they really want to go, like everyone's always going to Chicago or something, They'll, they'll be more likely to go to those bigger cities and like to the point where bands would identify with that, venues would identify with that, and so those smaller cities would then start to build venues and all that. The, the ticket, are the tickets guaranteed though, right? Like if there's a big enough it's, wait list, then how are you guaranteed actually getting the You're, you're so not. It's, you get put on the waiting list. You know, you put that down. The, you get put no, on no, 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 no. Like it's, that's, that would ruin their whole, so yeah, it's all at no fee. Um, but like, it, like if if you keep getting on a waiting list to shows that everybody else is going to, how do you actually get to go to a show? Well, um, roll the dice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
quite well. I've never read through the shows. <laughs> 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 for the shows that we looked at, they weren't actually sold out, so it's like they had like a direct buy link to go and put a ticket in your cart and get it right there. Yeah, you're but, not going to be getting some the tickets through this app. I didn't ask for them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, if, if they the text you is, when the, like, when they're they're available. Yeah, if it comes more available, 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 they'll let yes. you know. So yeah. it is like a game that they did have Taylor Swift on the website, so they're they're telling yeah, Well, I mean, good, they like like I said, it's that. like not all the shows are going to be sold out. In which case, in which case, you'll just be able to straight up buy the mm -hmm. ticket. But you know, it's like for shows that it's like they sold a bunch of them, and then the venue decides that okay, well we can. We well, that's, that's where the tracking extra. comes in too. You know, if they, if it's something that they see that you're tracking, you know, you're tracking so and so fan, you get a heads up. Yeah. So, do, so they get to know like before like other like official announcements of like when the venues will have the artists, like when they when they like like say they booked it the second that they're coming in, mm -hmm. like will they have the inside track on knowing when that they're actually coming before some of these other aggregated websites? To give an edge that's on getting the uh, tickets like quicker, or that's a good question. Yeah, we we don't really know the answer to that. That would that would be a huge win for them if that's if that's the case. Well, I don't think that they would get concert announcement before you know some of the major band websites before would announce them. Mm -hmm. But they would be able to kind of track because again, we're assuming that they do have some sort of agreement with the venues. If that's the case, they'll be able to track ticket sales they'll be able to they'll be able to see you know how fast they're selling whether or not they uh a show is uh projected to sell out right with that information they they can kind of track and tell you know we're probably going to get this much spare tickets you know yeah. they think of it as a clearinghouse for unsold tickets of like the, the promoter knows okay the show's in three days ticket sales have been shit mm -hmm. like we're gonna go to the guys that are, are curating this app and say and offer to say hey promote this up, here's an extra few bucks, and uh, you know, get this high in the suggestion list so that people buy all these extra tickets for it. Gets so that is it. actually how a lot of that would work. There's actually an article online that says that that's why venues are signing up for it, because it's helping them right. to guarantee it that they can sell it. Yeah, the promoters would be really into this just to clear out those unsold tickets. I wonder if you can add like, a, like, a, like, like the pricing engine that, that airlines have. Where you know, depending on the on the availability, the prices change. So you know, you have this unsold band of tickets. You start to get discounted prices. Don't give them that. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not how the guarantees of venues. Work. People hated search pricing. Yeah, too girl. Good job, y'all. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, so if y'all want to just talk to each other or whatever, um, I don't mind down with any beer left. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you guys.